Two. Okay. And welcome back. How are we getting on? Yeah, Today we're joined good. by Chris DeVault. Chris, this is like your fourth time here. Um, you're a permaculturist, yeah. so I've got a big question for you. Chris, what's the best plants? <laughs> well, so we gotta we got to kind of like dissect that question um, <laughs> quite extensively because it's a very difficult question to answer. So, um, you know, Thomas and, and yourself, you're asking about a plant. And so, you know, that can include both annuals and perennials. Um, so if I was to say, you know, on an annuals, which is, you know, it's a plant that, that's going to grow, it's going to uh, fruit and it's going to die all in one year, whereas a perennial just grows year after year, right? Um, and those annuals are really herbaceous type plants. And so in permaculture, there's quite a few uh, herbaceous type plants that are really talked about quite extensively. One of them is comfrey. Um, comfrey is this, uh, has this really broad leaf on it. It's a very hairy leaf. But what's really cool about comfrey is, is that it is what's called a biodynamic accumulator, meaning that it sends this really giant taproot into the ground and it, it, it pulls up all the minerals um, out of the ground, very, very deep in the ground where other plants can't access it. And what you do with comfrey is you can do what's called chop and drop. So you just cut the leaves off and then you just throw them at the base of, of, of another plant or you know, throw them on top of your garden bed. And it's like you have free fertilizer or free um, uh, mineral fertilizer. You can also take the leaves and put them in a bucket of water for like a week or two until it gets really nasty. And then you have liquid fertilizer. So um, comfrey is one of the most talked about plants, um, herbaceous plants in permaculture. But the other side of the, the equation is, is that um, – uh, trees, in, in, in my opinion, if, if you are wanting to develop a permaculture style property, you have to uh, focus your efforts on getting as many trees as possible. So in any ecosystem, trees are what's considered a climax species. You have these canopy style trees. And so if I was really wanting to have a tree um, that would produce the most calories for me, it would probably be a nut, some type of a nut tree. And the problem with nut trees, though, is they may take, you know, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years uh, to produce a crop. Mm. But if a nut tree is going to take 30 years to produce a crop, it'll probably live for 800 years of producing calories. And so if you think about it, like from a permaculture perspective, and you think about always trying to obtain a yield, well, nut trees are just massively calorically dense. Um, they produce tens of thousands of calories, and they also are comprising um, a fat source in your diet. And so if you think about it, um, you know, you've got carbohydrates, um, like your, your sugars, and you've got your fats, and you've got your protein. Well, if you're trying to develop a, a permaculture-style permacul property, you need to really work within each of those three elements. And so um, if you're raising uh, domesticated animals or if you are uh, hunting or foraging, you can really solve your, your protein intake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, chickens alone could, could solve your, your protein intake. Sugars are really simple because you have fruit trees and you can dehydrate those, uh, those fruits. But what you really need to focus on from a, uh, a nutritional perspective and a caloric density perspective is the fats. And so, you know, I've got a few avocado trees, but, you know, in other areas of the country or the world where it's very cold, I would, I would be getting a nut tree, um, you know, get a mature nut tree on your property and you'll be, you'll have more calories than you could ever possibly imagine. And like, you know, a peach tree, if you plant a peach tree, peach trees don't live that long. I mean, they may live like, you know, 10 or 15 years, to be honest. But um, after that, they're going to die. But like I said, you know, nut trees, like 500 years is kind of the baseline, right? So, you know, if you plant a nut tree, you know, your great, 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 great grandchildren are going to be um, eating nuts from it. So um, I would focus on a nut tree, to be honest. Mm. Mulberry is another good one. Mulberry is a tree that, um, do you guys have mulberries in, in, in Ireland? Uh, it's an American native. So unfortunately not. Oh my gosh, I'll have to send you some cuttings or something then. But mulberries are, in my opinion, they're one of the best tasting fruits. They provide, you know, really gorgeous um, shade to your, to your ecosystem and they just produce massive amounts of calories. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a, a mulberry tree, but, you know, 
I have a few of them. They produce fruits that are, I kid you not, they're that long. And there's just thousands of them all across the tree. There's no way mm. you could ever eat as many mulberries as, as one mulberry tree would, you would try. produce. So I've seen people you try. Could, you could sure as, you could sure as heck try, you know, you, you, you might make yourself sick, but um, so, you know, when I think of designing a property, which is really what permaculture is about, you know, and I think about, you know, I really want to have like an 80% mix an 80% of trees and 20% annual garden vegetables. Um, if I'm going to really, um, you know, quote unquote, go off grid or, or have enough um, cal calories in my diet coming from my yard. Well, that was a very uh, educational answer <laughs> for what the best plan is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sure. Um, I heard about the first well, movie yeah, you were talking about before. People compare it to uh, yeah, country. Like chicken poop in terms of its um, fertilizer capacity. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it, it, and plus it's like, you know, if you think about permaculture, right? Let's say that you want to get a couple chickens, okay? Um, those chickens have input needs into your system, okay? So you've got to have feed for the chickens. Well, so if you're getting chickens, you need to think about the inputs into them and the outputs um, that you get from them. So if you want to reduce your feed costs um, for chickens, comfrey is, a, is what's considered one of the best animal fodders. So like when I, um, when I cut um, comfrey, most of the time I'm not using it for fertilizer. I'm actually using it for, for feed for my chickens. And so if you think about a truly sustainable system, like you picture a circle, you have inputs that are coming into your property and you have a yield that's coming out of your property. Well, if you're dependent on all of these inputs coming into your system, you don't have a resilient um, permaculture property. Right. And so, you know, people are like, oh, I'm going to get some I'm going to get some chickens and, and um, then I'm going to go down to my big box retailer store and I'm going to buy a whole bunch of compost and you know, build up my garden beds. Well, those are all inputs into your system. And so consequently, you're dependent upon those inputs into your system. And if there's ever a scenario whereby those inputs get cut off, your, uh, the, resilience of your, the resiliency of your system just falls apart overnight. Um, and so in permaculture, a lot of people talk about closed loop systems. Closed loop systems is whereby um, you, don't have external inputs or you're minimizing your external inputs and all of your um, needs for your system are met inside the loop. So it's a closed loop uh, system. So, you know, that's kind of the next layer of design, right? Is like you think about, well, what, what do I, what are my needs that I want to be met? You know, I, I, I have, you know, food, I have water, I have, I have shelter and I have air, you know, the four basic uh, essentials of, of, of being able to survive on our planet. Well, you know, from a food perspective, you know, you have to have those, there's has to be inputs, but you know, again, if you're going to the closed loop system, you're, you're closing off that loop to external inputs. You know, I get so um, up in arms when I see some of these, you know, there's some of these gardening pages on Instagram and they show these just, you know, amazing harvests, but you know, they went and bought a dump truck full of compost and, and, you know, they, um, they're spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on fertilizers and, and rock sure. dust minerals and worm castings. Those are all inputs to your system. And that's not a sustainable system. Like I said, you know, if, if something were to happen um, to society or to supply chains, I mean, you know, right now we're facing a global pandemic and, and supply chains are, um, are just falling apart. You know, the largest, um, one of the largest, most well-respected seed companies in the United States is a company called Baker Creek. Their, their website is rareseeds.com. And if you go to their website right now and try to buy seeds, there's a warning on their website that says that we, they've been, um, their supply chain is basically falling apart because of COVID and they're delaying shipments. Like if you try to go buy seeds right now online, a number of seed companies, you can't, you can't get seeds. Um, so again, you know, those are inputs into your system and if yeah. that becomes, you know, it all impacted, your whole system will fall apart. So then you got to start thinking about, well, going back to that closed loop system, well, you should have been saving seeds from your earlier harvest because you don't want to be dependent upon external uh, inputs into your system. So if you're building resilient ecosystems, if you're building if you want to meet all your needs, which, you know, permaculture talks about this a lot, right, is 
there's this sense of freedom that comes with permaculture, right? If, if I can supply all of my four basic elements of, of, of surviving, then I'm not effectively owned by any organization, right? So if you have a property that you own and you can grow your own food and you can, um, uh, you can store and harvest your own water resources and filter your own water resources, I mean, you're, you know, that lack of dependency upon the system uh, really is what, in my mind, is, is kind of freedom because your you're freedom, um, you have freedom from any uh, dependent system. And we've, as a society, we've grown to such a degree that we are all so dependent upon the system and we're dependent upon a just-in-time supply chain, right? So if you're hungry, you can get in your car, you have access to gas, you can drive to a, a fast food place, you can go to the drive through get yourself a hamburger, come home, life is, is good. But all of that is very much dependent upon these systems that we've created around the world, whereby we've become dependent upon them, right? So, you know, there's very few people that, you know, even have, um, you know, some basic necessities as far as, a, as far as a backup. And I think that COVID is really... Um, calling a lot of uh, assumptions into question, which is like, well, in the U.S., when, um, when we first had our lockdowns, you know, people couldn't go to the store. Like, grocery stores' shelves were, were empty. They were barren. Um, same here. And, you know, people uh, were... Uh, pictures of oh, was it same there? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, it right? And so it, it is terrifying. And, you know, people, that's what, in the U.S., that's what caused a lot of panic in people. And so they had these... Um, people would that would go and they would hoard and they would they would buy in excess, but you know they were, you know, when people go to the grocery store and they, they clean out the shelves, it, it's really based out of fear. And what permaculture will teach you is, is that you have nothing to fear if you know how to uh, meet your own needs, right? Yeah, oh, it, it, it's an interesting concept, permaculture. And it's one over the pandemic I've kind of fallen in love with. And obviously, since we've had yourself and Oliver Gashi on so much, and we're yeah. having, you know, you know Pete Canaris, um, he's getting yeah, on at some point. That's too. A, he's a great guy. Oh, he, he's class. Yeah, um, Pete's a, he's a yeah, guy. Yeah, Pete's a great guy. I, um, so um, Pete and I uh, went to uh, Florida in the United States because uh, Jeff Lawton, do you guys know who Jeff Lawton is? I do. Okay, yeah, so um, a little background on, on, on permaculture for, um, for your guests and your viewers is, is that um, permaculture was really um, kind of codified in the late 60s, around like 1969 by a guy by the name of Bill Mollison. And Bill Mollison and David Holdengren, um, they kind of really established the fundamentals of permaculture in the, in the mid-70s. In the early 1980s, um, uh, there was a... Bill Mollison had a student by the name of Jeff Lawton in his class. And Jeff Lawton is probably the most uh, well-known and respected permaculturist um, ever in, in, in history. He's, um, he's based out of uh, Australia on the West Coast. But um, so Pete Canaris and myself, we, were, um, we went down to a, a workshop because Jeff rarely makes it to the U.S. And so um, he and I both went down to uh, Florida where Jeff was designing uh, a property for another Australian guy who had moved from Australia to, uh, to Florida. And so that was a really uh, fantastic opportunity. And, and um, Pete's a really, really great guy. I'm, I'm really excited to see how many wonderful things that he's doing. Um, so, yeah, Pete's a really good guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> at least uh, we have your verification there. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, like I said, if if, if, um, if we get the chance, we'll have to all uh, all of us jump on the line. I I was actually just um, messaging Pete yesterday about a, you know, we were talking about mulberry trees, right? Well, there's this there's a type of mulberry tree that's called a shatut uh, mulberry, which is only it's native to Pakistan, and nobody in the United States has this variety of mulberry. How, and how it's is the it best Pakistan? mulberry there is. I thought mulberry was native to the United States. No, well, there, there's there's multiple species of of of, of, multi, of mulberries, but this specific um, variety is is um, is from uh, Pakistan, I believe. So it's spelled shatut, which is S H A T O O T, shatut uh, mulberry, and so they have them in in, in Australia, um, but they really have never made it out 
beyond, um, you know, say like the, the Middle East and, and, um, and, and parts of Asia and, and Australia. So um, I've, I've been trying to bug Pete to try to get his hands on um, this mulberry uh, because I'm, I'm sh- so Pete runs a, you know, he kind of does, a, he has a nursery and then he kind of does um, plant installations uh, around Florida. And I told him that, uh, you know, if he can get his hands on this mulberry, he would just, he would make a killing because there's so many people that are looking for it. Mm. And it's considered one of the, one of the best tasting varieties. So, um, but yeah, if you get a chance, we'll, we'll all have to jump on and, and, uh, and talk permaculture. It's funny because Pete just recently got chickens. Um, and so he has, a, this is the first time getting chickens. And so I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to hear how he's, how he's getting on with, uh, with chickens. Yeah. Look, I've, I've every intention of having you on when he's on. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, I know, I know all of Gosh, yeah. he's pretty busy at the moment, but, um, I'm yeah. assuming you'll be available for that kind of conversation. Um, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, like, yeah, I would love to jump on. And, and, um, the thing with permaculture is, is that there's different, uh, what I call contexts in permaculture, right? There's somebody that could be living in an apartment complex, practicing permaculture on their veranda or their little area of their apartment complex. I've seen, I've talked to people that have an apartment, a 900 square foot apartment. They're breeding rabbits and quail in their apartment. They've got a garden um, on their veranda of their apartment. They've got um, a rain tank that catches water coming off the apartment. And then there's guys like, you know, um, Oliver, and Oliver specializes in um, large acreage restoration, which is kind of the, um, the environmental push behind permaculture. And yeah, like um, he's in Spain right so now all... trying, to, trying to sort an area out because it was getting, it was basically absorbing no rain. So he wants it to like, you know, I guess absorb more water than it currently is. Yeah. So the fundamental, um, so again, I, I think we talked about this on one of our earlier discussions, but in permaculture, there's these fundamental tenets or rules. And what happens, um, and this is kind of a, a, a new area of science. When you deforest an area, you'll get less rainfall. And, and because you're, you're breaking up the, um, uh, the water cycles uh, that, that trees actually help produce. And so when you have an area, and um, probably not the case in, in, uh, in Ireland because you guys get so much water, but you know, in parts of, you know, say, Africa or Spain, Portugal is another really bad one where you know, through history, um, the land has not been respected and they've deforested the entire land and that's actually affecting water cycles. And so you're not getting as much rainfall as you previously had. And then you're having erosion because you don't have, um, you don't have those trees to, to kind of um, brace the, the soil and, and hold and have a, a larger water capacity. And so in permaculture, there's this idea of um, stop it, spread it and soak it. So if you have rainfall coming onto your property, the last thing you want to do is have all that rain wash off um, into the street or wash mm-hmm. out ultimately into the oceans. So the first thing you need to do is, is, um, is to stop the flow on your property. So, you know, people have talked about um, digging swales. You probably have heard that term in, in, in permaculture, um, ponds or dams. That first yeah. intent is to get it to stop on your property and then to get it soaked down. And so I think what Oliver's trying to do is, is to get greater um, water holding capacity into the landscape. Yeah, that's what he's And doing. once he does that, then he can come in and, and seed it and kind of rebuild the, the ecosystem. But, you know, from my perspective, like, you know, so I'm a different, um, so everyone has a different type or approach to permaculture. So Oliver is approaching it from a, an environmental restoration perspective. Um, you know, uh, Pete is, uh, you know, he's working with, um, kind of in the urban areas where he's, um, getting people excited about, um, growing fruit trees. And me, I'm just like, you know, I, I think the world is, is going to shit. So I'm going to build up as much <laughs> resiliency on my ecosystem as, as I can. And, and, um, um, you know, have your, have my chickens and my bees and my gardens and my fruit trees and, and, and my goats. And, and, you know, I, um, uh, it's pretty amazing. Like if, if you gents are ever in the U S you've got to stop by my property. I'll, um, I'll feed you a five course meal from my property. <laughs> I'm sure. I know. I'm sure it'd be one of the most exotic dishes we've ever had. Yeah. Sounds All fucking amazing. homegrown. Cause, like, Cause some of the stuff you grow, it yeah. still amazes me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You guys, um, I posted a couple of really cool pictures um, recently on, um, on Instagram. So you have to check out my cabbage. Do you guys see my cabbage? I seen your cabbage. 
I don't know. Can we, yeah. can we still? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just I'm about to bring it up. Give me a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah check out. Uh, yeah, you have to check out the cabbage because. Um, or and so, the squash you know, one, too. I don't. Take things big in your fucking torso. Oh yeah, torso. The squash. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there's also um, uh, there's a really great picture um, uh, of what's called a, a Chinese python snake bean, which is like a green bean, only it's like five feet long. I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, so oh, you've it seen that? Confused and, what that uh, was. <laughs> it's crazy. It tastes just like green beans, man. You you chop it up, you would never know the difference. Mm. Um, so you know, I. Um, I grow some, some seriously, some, um, some interesting varieties, um, basically because a lot of different, um, plants and vegetables interest me, but I kid you not, you know, as long as I've studied permaculture and as long as I will study permaculture, I will never learn all the unique plants. Like it's almost like every day I learn about some new plant. And when you study permaculture, you'll understand how plants grow and you could basically grow anything. Um, once you understand the, the fundamentals. Let's see what we got here. Jeez, look at that. Yeah. Can't, can't, can't see it yet, can we? <laughs> no, that, that's, that's mud. That no, the, what's, that, that, what's that one right there in the top left? That's mud. That's, yeah, what's that's that? different. That's called tu, um, it's turmeric. Do you, know, you guys know what turmeric is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have turmeric here, yeah. I was just yeah, confused. Yeah. It's so, huge. Um, Isn't yeah, turmeric well, tiny? There's also different varieties. Right, so the, the one on the far left is like your standard um, turmeric. That's what everyone knows about. But there's like all these different varieties of, of turmeric and there's blues and there's blacks and there's greens and they all have these different health benefits. Um, so I, I'm basically, and a lot of them are, are rare and, and actually um, endangered. So mm. I'm planting a bunch on my property and then I hope to, you know, um, give them away to other permaculturists and, and make sure that, that some mm. of those specific varieties are, are saved. Uh, don't isn't turmeric like super good in, in fighting off COVID? Oh yeah, it's it, it's one of the major major um, nutritional powerhouses. And and um, like if you're ever getting sick, you know you make yourself a little um, you know a ginger and turmeric tea, or you add yeah. turmeric to your, your it's a it, it's an amazing amazing immunity booster, right? I think you most know, people should supplement people, the turmeric. Oh yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Like if you ever watch, I, I know, um, you know, like Joe Rogan is all about turmeric. Um, it? you know, it, it's one of, it's like the top 10, um, you know, nutritional, um, powerhouses and it has, um, it has immunity boosting, um, uh, features. So, um, particularly with COVID, you know, if you're, you can't make it down to the, to your local doctor and have some good immunity boosters. Yeah, this, this picture right here is, um, a variety of cabbage called red acre. And, um, like that's one of the bigger ones, but it's, it's not too far off of the standard size. But like I made that into um, um, into sauerkraut. You guys, you guys like sauerkraut? No, not the biggest so you fan. Can, you can make, but I'd have it. Yeah, but the thing is, is like I can make sauerkraut and I can store my my cabbage for like nine months pretty easily, right? Um, so it, it's just it, it, it's um, again if you. I say this in almost all my posts when I post pictures of, um, of, of some of the things that I grow, which is I don't really grow the cabbage. I grow life in the soil. Everything is about soil in permaculture. You've got to really understand it. You've got to have microbiology in your soils. If you have microbiology in your soils, you will grow some of the most amazing things um, that you could ever possibly imagine. So, um, yeah, this is a variety of, of cabbage called, uh, called Red Acre. How, how I think, you know, Thomas, if you go to the, what, how, how much if you click on the next photo, you'll show you a picture. So the, the head, there's the head of the cabbage right in the, um, in the center. But, you know, I'm not a big fan of, um, of, uh, of cabbage. I mean, it, it, it's nice. I, you know, you, you can make a roll out of it, but you know, one of the good things, again, going back to, you know, having a good nutritional um, basis, is that you know if you eat fermented foods like fermented vegetables it's wonderful for you it has all the probiotics in it right so yeah i take my cabbage and i, I make sauerkraut and you know some people like it some people don't i add enough salt that it tastes pretty damn good but um it's great because it's a, it has it's full of probiotics um so yeah if you guys ever check out um, fermenting foods you know fermenting foods is a great way to store your um uh, your Absolutely. excess produce right and so it's kind of like, it's very analogous to a squirrel storing nuts for the winter, right? I mean, you want to um, start learning how to preserve your foods and dehydrate your foods. 
um, you know, get yourself a deep freezer and, and um, you know, store a lot of your excess um, fruits and vegetables. Um, like I, I have a bunch of um, peaches and plums and nectarines, apples. I, I dehydrate those. So I've got, um, um, you know, uh, apple chips and stuff all, all in my, uh, in my pantry. So if you pull up, um, Thomas, if you click on that picture, of that squash, I'll tell you something really cool. Top left, is it? Uh, up. Yeah. Yeah, they're right there. You're on it. So this is kind of cool. What you can do with, um, and there's a, I, I grow mushrooms all the time in the winter time. So there's a mushroom. Those, those are oyster background. mushrooms, right? Yep, those are oysters. So on the left, you, um, on the left, that's that's uh, Florida oyster, and then on the right is, um, no, no, yeah, on the on the right is, is blue oysters. Um, when you, you guys, fry those, yeah, things. you guys ever get a? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! You, you, you're just <laughs> yeah. amazing. Uh, if you get like, I kid you not, I uh, I take my oyster mushrooms and I I make stir fry. Man, if you put oh, like, yeah. just melt some butter in a pan and skillet fry some oyster mushrooms. It is just ridiculously good, yeah, yeah. and you you can't you know you can you can go to the store and you can buy like dehydrated mushrooms, but you can't none of the grocery stores in the U.S. here you can go and buy fresh mushrooms. It, it's just because they have such a difficulty with their with their shelf life. You can't have somebody grow them and then ship them. Um, you know, if you get like those little button mushrooms, but like man, you can yeah. use some butter and some oyster mushrooms. Just forget about it. Um, <laughs> And I sent you, um, uh, Gerard, I think I sent you like a picture of, of a rabbit and I cooked it with, um, uh, oh, with yeah, oyster yeah. mushrooms and it was, it was just phenomenal. But and like purple mashed potato squash. or something? Yes, right. It's, it's purple sweet potato. So I had purple sweet potato, onions, garlic, and, and oyster mushrooms all from the garden. Not bad. Just forget about <laughs> it. There's, you, you, you could go to a five-star restaurant and you won't be able to get that kind of uh, meal. Um, and one thing I was going to mention about this, uh, about this picture, which is really cool. Um, so these squashes, um, you'll never, this squash does not exist in the world other than at my property. I'll tell you why is because I bred it myself. Um, so when you learn about growing things, you can, um, intentionally cross pollinate two different varieties, right? So, um, it, with squashes, you have winter squashes and you have summer squashes, primary difference being winter squashes have a long um, shelf life. So it's like your pumpkins, uh, you know, your acorn squashes, your spaghetti squashes, those are winter squashes and you can put them on a shelf and they will last um, a year. In fact, that, that one big giant squash that I have on my shoulder, I, I still have it. And it's, um, Oh my God, it's well over a year old now. So Thomas, can you find um, that one? It's, I'll, it's I'll, pretty I'll impressive. Have a look yeah, yeah. Right. So I, um, what you can do is you can intentionally cross different varieties of, of squashes. And I have, I crossed um, a winter squash with a summer squash. And so consequently, I have this, uh, a summer squash, but it has the shelf life of, of a winter squash. So you can get really creative um, with, uh, there's that snake bean right there. Yeah, I should say, man, um, Jesus Christ, I would not hold a snake in the front. <laughs> fuck, fuck that. <laughs> like, I know, I know there's probably nice ones out there, but at the same time, man, I, I wouldn't, I'm good, you know, I'll pass. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> there's some more, uh, there's some mushrooms that, going on. That apple looks too. fucking uh, sick. What, is that an apple? Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, it's an, that's apple. an apple. Fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah, nice one. <laughs> yep. And all these, um, all apples um, actually come from Kazakhstan. So an interesting, uh, interesting fact. There it is. There it is. Yes. Uh, there it looks, is. Look size that thing. Massive. <laughs> like, what do you even make with that? Like, n no joke. How many? I don't know what, um, well, what you do with that thing. It's just huge. <laughs> well, I. Um, this is. There's probably like you know, at least five or six meals out of this thing. I mean, you know, I didn't eat it all in one go. Um, this is, this is a variety. I still actually have this one on the shelf, um, just curing, but, um, this is a, what's called a Hubbard style squash. It's a, um, um, they call it a, a red variety. They also have a blue variety. In fact, um, I'll have to dig up a picture. I didn't, I never posted the Instagram, but I, I kid you not. I have a blue one of these that's bigger than this one. Um, it's freaking massive, but it was from two seasons ago and I never got a chance to plant it. Um, but it's, that's called a Hubbard style squash and that's actually called a Boston marrow. And, you know, it's, it's really cool because there's a whole, there's stories about squash varieties that you just, you know, it's like this, the one on my shoulder here, if you, if you read the, uh, if you read the verbiage there, you know, these were grown by like, um, the native Americans in the U S 
right? And so if you want to like, you know, survive, if you want to build a, a, a property that, you know, you can, you know, can produce all your means. Like what I do is I look at the Native Americans and the Indians um, in the U.S. And, and how the hell they survived, you know, with nothing but a bow and arrow, right? Um, and they would grow a lot of these squashes um, like this, like both of these are, are from Native um, from Native Americans. And um, man, that, that thing, you know, easily five or six meals. But what I do is I chop it up and I, most of the time I uh, put it in the oven and roast it. Mm. Or you can make, I've made pies out of it. And, and uh, dude, you can do anything. That sounds pretty good. But, oh my God, if you've ever had a, um, holy shit, like uh, a squash pie, man, like, oh, forget about it. You put a little brown sugar on it. It's just forget about it. Oh, it's just it's <laughs> ridiculous. So um, people just don't know what they're missing. Like, you know, people don't even know what food is anymore. Right. I mean, you go to the grocery store and uh, we've talked about this before, but it's like, you know, people don't even know what the hell a tomato tastes like because the industrial agriculture system, um, you know, had to pick that tomato uh, before it was ripe uh, because it doesn't ship well if it's ripe and people just don't even like if I gave you a tomato from my garden that has been you know like they have the sun on it and it's ripening on the vine you will think that you were eating like an absolute piece of fruit it's just got so much sugar content in it so yeah that's the thing like e- even here uh, well we have a pretty advanced agricultural system in Ireland um, yep. you, know, you know like so our food variety is pretty pretty poor like yeah. outside, outside of you know your standard, you know bit of steak, your you know your uh, your pig, chicken, turkey, you don't really try anything else in terms of meats. And then in terms of you know your 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 vegetables as well, they're pretty well set. Like mm. yeah, a sweet potato was exotic. Do you know how weird that is? <laughs> that's that's, that's, not, that's, I mean, that's not a joke. Is, um, a sweet potato would yeah. be pretty well, exotic what, for some people. That's that's. That's amazing to me. And the reason is, is like, you know, if you are concerned about your health and you're concerned about your nutrition, you know, so that, look, look, let's just back up here for one second, because, you know, first of all, what you're describing is, is a lack of diversity, but any food that comes into um, a grocery store from the industrial agriculture system is absolute shit, in my opinion. It's got no nutrition in it whatsoever, right? Um, they're, well, it depends. Crops are grown. Like, like in the United what, States versus the Netherlands in terms of how they grow their plants, you know, it'd be very different. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking mostly from the United States. And, and you know, we have, if you go look at, a, um, you know, a field, uh, an agricultural field in, in the United States, there's a 99% chance that it is absolutely devoid of nutrients because they till the, the, the land and they're killing all the biological life in there. They're only using three elements um, to fertilize it, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Yet there's 72 different trace minerals, right? And so there's, there's a lot of um, research on this and documentation on this, but it's like the food that makes it to the store shelves is just like depleted of, of nutrition. And so even if you were to say, you know, I want to be healthy, I'm going to go eat organic food. I'm going to go to the grocery store and pay, you know, three times the price for organic food that still doesn't have nutritional density. That just means it's not been treated with, with pesticides. Um, so if you grow a cabbage in soil that has no um, microbiology and no life in the soil, you're going to have the, um, a below average nutrient profile in that cabbage. Yeah. Um, so it's another reason to grow your own is because, you know, we're slowly being killed by, um, by, the, by our food systems. So, but you are right. You know, I, um, you know, but I'm telling you, somebody that's that's growing some potatoes, you know, in some, uh, you know, small hut in the middle of Ireland, those are going to be healthier potatoes than something you go buy in a bag at the store. I mean, as a general rule of thumb. Yeah. So. I know there's a, there's, a, there's a local shop here and they get all their potatoes from Cyprus. Like we don't even have local yeah, well, potatoes. Well, they, exactly. So think about that though. Most. Is, well, the thing is, is like anything that you're importing as a country, you're becoming dependent on another country for your for your needs, right? And um, well, I mean, you guys we, know better. We're than more me, accepting but, uh, of that because we're part of the European Union. It's like it's like a United uh, States kind of thing, you know? Like we're yeah. it's helping each other. It's free trade um, among each other, blah blah blah. So if I get my things from you know Greece, Germany, I don't mind. 
I, I don't mind at all. Yeah, yeah. But like, if I was getting my, my potatoes from Brazil, who's, where, which is miles away, I'd be a bit concerned. Not, yeah. nothing, nothing against Brazil. Yeah, well, <laughs> somebody from Brazil is going to watch this and they're going to get all pissed off. Um, well, the, the other thing too is, you know, from an environment. Chris, your, your audio cut out. Chris. Chris. Can he hear us? Your, your audio I don't, is I don't think he can hear us. Yeah, we, we can't hear you. Yeah, can't hear no. you. Yeah, yeah, jo join on your phone. We're going to have to edit this out. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's fine. Thomas, Eesh. how are you? How are you doing? I'm okay, Jared. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm talking to you. Yes. And we got, we got Chris over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> We're doing that's a, it. That's it. We're going to be a guest on a podcast later on. Make sure to check out Let's Chat Live. It'll already have been out by now. Oh, yeah. We've already been on it, but like, we got to yeah. tell them. There you, you go. Know, might go live later on. We'll see. Give Chris a second. He's on mute. Pretty sure he can hear us. Just smile and wave, Jared. Just off. <laughs> can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So sorry, my, my phone died. Um, so I'm, I plugged it in now, but um, okay. maybe we can try the computer uh, audio here for a few minutes until my phone charges. All right. So you were saying? Uh, yeah. So what I was saying is there is, I've got no problem with you getting potatoes from Germany, but what I would say is, is that there's an environmental cost associated with the logistics of getting you those potatoes. So they've got to put them on a truck and they've got to ship them. And that truck uses fossil fuels and, you know, it's going to befoul the atmosphere. There's going to be refrigeration requirements and those refrigeration requirements are also going to be run on fossil fuels. So in permaculture and a lot of, um, you know, I guess the organic movement would advocate buying local, getting as much as your food that you can locally because there's an environmental cost with transporting. You know, it's crazy. I'm in Southern California and I went to a grocery store the other day and there was oranges from New Zealand. I was like, what the hell, man? Like, do you have any idea how much it costs to get oranges from New Zealand to Southern California when we have, um, you know, citrus trees out here grow like weeds. So, you know, there's that craziness about it, but um, yeah, you're right. You guys are, you guys are um, a bit special. Um, we won't talk about the Brits, but um, you know, the European Union does have, um, you know, some advantages with, with their trade of their produce. I, I, I tell you what now, with Britain leaving um, the European Union, it's fucked up a lot of trade. And we got some food from a wholesaler recently and normally they have like the freshest food ever. I mean, just beautiful stuff. And, yeah. you know, they were basically... In terms of like fruit, they were basically fucked. Unless it was Irish, they were they were done. Um, <laughs> like no, they're, they're probably gonna go under at some point. Um, yeah. Like the strawberries they had there were awful. They're, like they didn't they didn't look as good as they used to. Like blah blah blah. Um, yeah, just with, with them pulling out, things get a bit more difficult. Or even ordering things online. Like there's no Amazon Ireland. There's Amazon UK, and we buy from that. So oh, yeah. you know we're getting. I, I ordered something the other day. I ordered it from uh, Amazon Germany. My receipt okay. came in German. I have no idea what, like, I have no idea if it's actually delivering to my address. But like, you know, fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I don't open. know how I don't know how it is um, uh, in in Europe, but you know what we're seeing in the United States, like small businesses have been decimated because of because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so many small businesses are going under, and you know. You know, my view on this is it just seems to be the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you know, we've we're you know a year into a global pandemic, and and you know I'm seeing businesses uh, close left and right, uh, which is really concerning. And you know, a lot of the large businesses like Amazon are are you know basically becoming monopolies because um, all the small guys have have gone out of business as a result. So we're in a we're in a world of shit. Yeah, yeah, it's rough. Make the rich richer kind of world and. Yeah, you know, especially in Ireland, our pubs have had it really, really bad over here. They were open for the last year, I'd say, for maybe less than a month. Oh yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's crazy. Um, well, you know, it's funny. Speaking they get, of, they uh, get paid a fair bit, like when they're just out of work. Like we, we pay people if they're if they, if they were affected by the pandemic. Yeah. So how, how much do you get a week, Thomas? You know, it's two fifty now. Two hundred and fifty euro per week for someone who's been done out of a job because of COVID. Yeah, like, 
I don't know how you would survive. Like, to be honest, like that's like, uh, well, like in the US, um, so you, that's, that's 250 euros. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit okay, more than well, dollars. Right. So it's like, um, you know, in the U S I honestly don't know how people survive, um, when they receive, uh, unemployment, uh, insurance here in the U S because it's such a, um, a small amount. Like, I don't even know how they, how they buy their groceries or, or, you know, pay their I'm electricity sorry. in their apartment. It's, it's just, it's virtually nothing. And so, um, yeah, I, I feel you. And I, I feel for the people that, um, you know, that are, that are on unemployment because it sucks, but I'll tell you what, man, it's like, now's the time you should be growing some gardens oh i i agree absolutely yeah um you know with, with the way it's gone i suppose you suppose you have to uh you, you've seen yourself like the the show's being cleared out there's no better time than now to try try get a green thumb yeah well the thing is is you know i i don't want to um scare anybody away but you know gardening has a pretty large surprisingly gardening has a, a, a really large learning curve and so if you don't, um, if you're coming into it um, fresh and, you know, you're like, I'm just going to put this seed in the ground and it's going to grow and I'm going to have so much food. I'm, I don't even know what I'm going to do with myself. That's you're wrong. It's not going to happen. There's um, a, a really steep learning curve um, with gardening, even though it seems relatively easy. There's a lot of information that you got to you got to learn about if you're going to you know get to square one. Um, but start somewhere and you. Um, you know, like I tell people, start with the easy stuff and, and then start, you know, building on um, the more difficult varieties. But, you know, you can do relatively well, you know, you, like in, um, uh, in the U.S., the, the Native Americans, they would grow, you know, the staples would be um, uh, beans, squash and corn. You know, you can have um, you can produce a lot of calories just by growing three crops. Um, I, I know that's very common. Was it? What's up with the audio there? I know it was very common in like, you know, Central America, but in um, like where the United States is now, would that have been a common practice? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, Cause so, those were very different cultures. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if we, um, so I would say, um, you know, a lot of all the way up into the ca Canadian border, um, Native Americans were growing um, the three sisters garden. We talked about that, right? Did I tell you about yeah. that? Yeah. 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 So it, it, it was, um, all throughout the United States, um, Native Americans would, would grow beans, corn, and, and squash. And, and um, you know, they would also, um, for their fertilizer, they would catch fish and, you know, they would eat the meat and then they would throw the dead fish under their plants. And that would act as their, as their fertilizer for the entire season. So um, there's so much that can be learned by looking at, uh, at Native Americans and how they, uh, how they survive. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, people from the area normally know us the best, uh, you know, it's just throughout history um, in general. Yeah. Are you, do you, do you hunt? Um, hunting is not cost effective here. How could it not be cost effective? Um, because hmm, cost of a firearm is ridiculous here because oh. Ireland wants to be a country with no guns. I understand oh. that. Yeah. Well, I, um, I saw you with a, with a bow and arrow. Uh, bow hunting is illegal in the Republic of oh Ireland. Oh my gosh in the united kingdom as well what? I'd, have to, I'd have to go to germany and then the exporting what the no oh unless i live in the states it ain't gonna be a thing holy um, shit man <laughs> like that's crazy like um well I, that, that's just mind-boggling to me that that you can't even you can't even hunt rabbits it's just kind of a european thing at this point you know that they take well, away that that ability you got to hunt foxes on your own property right yeah, you can you can kill foxes on your own property, and I, I think fox. there's no you, well, you don't you don't need a uh, don't shit on license you try to Chris. You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> with well, most things you need like I guess like permission, blah blah blah. With foxes, it's a weird one. You can just fucking kill that thing. It goes to your oh, garden, wow. blasts its head off. I think that's Holy really shit. weird. It's just so oh. it's so weird that that's the exception. A fucking fox. Yeah. Like if that's I see if I see rabbits in my garden, uh, and I. I kill it. I could face it fine. Yeah. Um, I face a bigger one. What if I fish out with a bow? Um, but I'm almost certain the kill time with a bow is is higher than that, or is lower than that of with a bullet because the wound is bigger. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, unless, I think with you're a rabbit, a you'd be, even with like a 22, you would be. I mean, 
so when, when I um, when I hunt rabbits, I use a bow uh, or I use a trap. But um, yeah, I like your style, I, Chris. There you go. Yeah, but I mean, there's you know you if you think about it, like organic you know grass fed meat. I mean, you cannot compare anything to like wild game. I mean, you know, it's um, you know a lot of the I've had some um, interesting discussions with with vegans in the past, and um, you know my my view on this. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of talked about this before, which is, you know, it's not the consumption of meat that is causing a problem, right? It is, it's the way that we raise the animals, okay? And Joe Rogan has talked about this a number of times, if you guys ever listen to his podcast when he's out hunting. Um, there is nothing, in my opinion, that is more um, ethically sound than, um, than hunting your own animals and, and, um, and you know, going out and foraging um, because, you are being a participant in that ecosystem, right? You're not torturing the animal um, in a large, what in the U.S. they call a concentrated animal feeding unit. You know, they're not standing in their own shit all day. Um, you're not raising them, you know, with the least cost. You know, it's, it's a, an animal that was, uh, that was lived a wild life and, and, and had a good life. And, and you're simply um, participating in, in that ecosystem. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I, um, and to think about it, I mean, it's like, you know, that's, a, I, I can't eat an entire rabbit in one meal. It, it's a two meal um, uh, feed, to be honest. And so um, there's a lot of calories for very little effort. And, you know, it's like, if I'm growing gardens in my backyard, rabbits are, are, are a bit of a pest, you know, they can come in, they can eat my carrots or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but by protecting my crops, I'm also getting another yield, which is a, which is a source of protein for me. So, um, and there's my God, man, there's, there's so many rabbits, um, around my property. It's insane. I've, I've got, uh, coyotes and mountain lions that, that come in and, and, and go after the rabbits. So there's a bit of an over overpopulation of rabbits right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, um, in, in the wild, you, you'd be surprised how few animals, you know, die of old age. You know, the, it's either yeah. when you're a hunter, it, it's, it's weird that hunters are so involved in conservation. Like yeah. you, you would think, because obviously that often they're demonized. But you'd be surprised how many are like out there, you know, wanting ecosystem restoration and, you know, just make the place better, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that um, a lot of hunters that I know, um, I would consider them to be a naturalist, meaning that they understand um, how ecosystems work. And, um, you know, hunting, um, at least in the U.S., it's multi-billion dollar business, right? I mean, you know, um, the state collects all the fees from the permits that, that are used to go hunt. And then they take the, that, that money and they um, you know, they, they buy more lands or something, they, they improve the ecosystem. So there, there's a good feedback um, loop, but so many people are, um, are far removed from the idea of producing their own uh, meat because it's like, you know, butchering an animal, it, it's not the most pleasant thing. And quite frankly, if, if, if somebody was raised and has never butchered their own animal, it can be a very, very upsetting thing to, to see an animal butchered, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's like, well, it's, it's gross. There's blood everywhere. Um, but that's how, that's how psychotic we've become. We've become so removed from our food system uh, that the idea of, of butchering an animal is, is gross, but you'll go to uh, your fast food place and get a chicken sandwich. Like, you know, you basically have outsourced that violence uh, to the industrial agriculture system. And from my perspective on it, you know, if you want to eat meat, that's fine, but, you know, get your hands dirty and, and do it yourself. Uh, when I was younger, I, um, I did like work experience for around six months in a, in a butchers. And I'd say it's one of the best things I've ever done. Cause I, at least I got to know not where it's from, but like, I, I hated working there for say the first week because of all the blood. It, it's shock, it's Fair. shocking how like you know it, it's weird being there in the first week and you're moving crates of chicken you know and like it's it's mad but then after like first two three weeks like you, you get used to it and you realize this that's just how it is you know yeah yeah well yeah and i i think that there's um 
you know, but it's interesting, right? It's like, you know, if, if I was going to um, butcher one of my chickens, you know, my chickens, um, I kid you not, I, I joke around with this with a lot of people, but I, I firmly believe that my chickens live a better life than some um, people do. Like in the U.S., we have a, a, a homeless population. You know, my chickens live a better life than, than a homeless man on, on a street corner. I mean, they're, um, they can feel um, the wind on their feathers. They can, they can see the sun. Um, you know, they, they're social animals so they can interact with people. They're not under stress. In the U.S., if you go buy a chicken sandwich, that chicken was raised in the most inhumane um, conditions that you could ever possibly imagine. In fact, I've got a video on, on my Instagram about this that shows what a chicken uh, production factory looks like. It's it's fucking horrendous. I mean, you know, so, um, you know, again, there's there's an ethical responsibility, right? I mean, it's like if you can move towards, um, you know, either hunting or, or raising your own animals, that's by far the greater ethical choice to make um, as opposed to participating in, in the food system. Um, you know, I, I don't even think some of these people, if you get a chance to take a look at some pictures or some videos of, of the way that, you know, chickens and pigs and cows are raised in these massive, massive operations, it's just, it's fucking horrible. It, it's terrible to be honest. I mean, it, it um, I can't possibly imagine. I mean, they're basically abused and tortured and I understand that, um, from the vegan argument, to be honest, but, um, you know, in my view, we're meat eaters. And so, you know, if you want to start moving towards a more ethical decision, then raise your own meat or, or, or hunt for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm going to get a little bit more, uh, get a, refill my drink. Okay. I'll be right back. Um, Chris, could you also fix the, um, the audio? We're kind of getting yep, give feedback. Me okay. Give me one second. All right. So, um, yeah, look, fucking permaculture is a, it's a weird beast. And it, it do, does bring you into these conversations of um, fucking, you know, I, I, I guess it gets you thinking in the vegan mindset, like, mm. okay, we shouldn't really enjoy uh, industrial agriculture, but you have to consider the hunting part. And that, that, that's, a weird, that's a weird thing to think about, that, you know, hunting, which has always been viewed as this, this weird thing or demonized, it's actually the more ethical choice than, you know, Schlonger. getting the packet of ham. <laughs> yeah, probably. It's, it's mean, weird. It's weird. Just when he was talking about chicken, it was so mad how you don't even think about these things for a very long time. And then it's just like you have a conversation like this. Like, it's mad how, like, free, like, do free range eggs, they cost more than, like, normal eggs. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, that's fucking horrible, isn't it? Mm. Just because the way the chicken's raised, that costs more money. Like, yeah. yeah shocking and even like the differences we treat our animals in Ireland because I think we treat ours pretty well I mean I live right beside a farm where there's cows and sheep out every morning you know like they, they seem pretty happy with life I don't know yeah in general we're, we're a lot nicer um, yeah. than, than some places well, like in um, the US they spray their chickens with like chlorine what the hell are they at over there uh, like <laughs> it's a bit of a weird one ah it's a bit of very weird yeah all right, let's see if Chris has his audio sorted. Mm. We'll give him a second. But, you know, it, 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 interesting um, idea mm. that uh, the hunting is more ethical. And it's, it's not limited to, like, deer or rabbits or whatever. Like, there's people in the United States who, who hunt fucking bears. Seriously? Yeah. Bears? Yeah, well, bear hunting. For what? For um, well, you can eat bear. You, you can eat bear. Like, okay. see, most people are doing it for food. I think if you're not doing it for food um, or because the population is invasive, it's probably a bit dodgy. Yeah. Um, you know, like if you go out and you hunt a wild boar and they're an invasive species where you are, you're eating up the place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That just makes sense. Um, now the, the bear is a bit of a weird one. I'm sure there might be uh, problems with bears in some places. I, I've, I've heard of towns infested by bears. Um, really? Yeah. Wow. There's a town in the United States that has more bears than people. Somewhere <laughs> like that, you know, it, that makes sense. Um, but, you know, on a case-to-case -case basis, it, it really depends. H how do you feel about hunting? Me? Oh, I say... I mean, if you're doing it for the right reasons, like you say, like, you know, for food and you're not doing it for sport or just for killing, then it should be considered, you know, if you're doing it because, like, 
to, like you said, to maintain population of the environment or habitat, then it's, it makes sense to do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's probably better, you know, if a rabbit lives its life in the woods and somebody comes and kills it instead of it, you know, being cooped up all day. Yeah, well, even, even the coop, <laughs> coop is, is better than some uh, things other animals get, like... Chickens, so, don't, chickens spend most of their lives, or especially for, like, oh, KFC and stuff, like, they're just... Rough. They're put in one thing for their entire life, told to lay eggs and... Mm. Then die yeah. at the end of the You guys there? Yep. Yep. You guys hear me? Okay, good. Yep. Perfect. Sorry about that. We're not okay. getting any feedback. So what we're you guys chatting about? We're just talking about the stance and hunting. Okay. Um, you know, like how it's it's weird that through conversation it's become more um ethical than what people used to think about it. Like, you know, growing up, hunting has always been demonized. Um, like absolutely very yeah. little exception. Um, uh, but then you know, compared to factory farming, it kind of, kind of wins ethically, and even how you do it, you know, like you're, a you're, rifle versus with a bow, but, 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 but you're always doing it for the fastest kill, so the thing suffers as le- yeah. as, as little as possible. You're a hundred percent correct, and that's that's been my whole, that's been my point um, for a very long time, which is. You know, for hunting to be demonized and you say, well, it, it, it's violent um, to hunt. But in all honesty, the violent aspect of it is, is how, um, how animals are raised in, um, in the industrial agriculture system. It's, it's horrendous. They are tortured from the day that they're born to the day that they die. They live in conditions that are just not unrecognizable. I mean, it'd be equivalent to you and I um, being raised in, in, you know, in a prison and, and but you know, a prison would look nice compared to what those, uh, what those animals do. So I don't, I don't accept the argument that it's, um, that, that hunting is, um, uh, you know, violent or that it's, it's mistreating animals. I mean, um, you know, most of the times when you, if, you know, you shoot an animal with, with, uh, with a large caliber rifle, I mean, it, it dies within seconds. Um, so, a lot of times they don't even know what happened. And um, I, I really, I 100% agree with you. I really think that's the, the ethical approach um, with, uh, with meat. If you're gonna consume meat, that's the ethical approach. No, that's not to say that hunting is the only ethical way. There's of course, like what you do, you raise your own chickens, uh, you raise rabbits, blah, blah, blah. That, yep. that, that just makes sense. You know, if you wanna keep a couple of cows, obviously you know yourself if you're treating them right. Uh, and if you're treating them wrong, yeah. you should know. Um, but the way it has yeah. to be done on, plus, on a mass scale is wrong. Yeah, and, and plus, you know what, um, th- this is just kind of my opinion, but, you know, even if you have, um, there's a lot of fuckery involved with raising animals and, and what, they're, what they feed them and the antibiotics that they use. If I need to um, butcher one of my chickens, I know exactly what that chicken is, has eaten. I know that it's not had any uh, antibiotics or, you know, growth hormone or whatever the hell they're using um, to raise animals these days. I know exactly what that, that animal has had. Um, you know, you go and buy meat. I mean, some, some of these people, they've got zero ethics. They, you know, they give their animals massive, massive amounts of, of, of antibiotics because they're raising them in conditions where they're not going to be healthy. They use um, growth hormones, um, steroids, it just, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of fuckery involved. And so you just, my perspective on it is, is that you can't trust a lot of these places where you, where you buy food you can, or buy meat particularly. So, um, you know, in the, um, in the U S for example, you know, I don't know, you guys have probably heard this, but the idea is, is that if you have a cow that eats grass, that meat is healthier than, uh, than other types of meats. Do they call it like, you know, grass fed um, yeah. beef or whatever the case may be. But um, again, going back to the fuckery is, you know, these, a lot of people will, you know, they'll raise their, their cows on pasture and they'll eat uh, grass. But then when they're ready to go to market, they just feed them silage and corn in the last, you know, uh, three months just to fatten them up for when they the go to more, uh, the more slaughterhouse. Okay. Do you not think silage is okay? Silage? Well, the, the, the thing with the thing with uh, with silage um, is uh, cows aren't meant to um, to eat any type of corn-based product, 
And so what happens from what I understand is, is that when it ferments in the cow's stomach, it produces um, negative uh, consequences because the cows aren't meant to eat corn. But the other thing is, is that it impacts the, the fat of, uh, of meat, right? So everybody thought that, um, you know, saturated fat was bad for us, but in actuality, saturated fat is not the bad thing. It's the, the profile of the fat, because you fed cows corn all the damn time, it has a lot more, um, um, the, the fatty acid profile of the fat of the meat is bad now. Hey, but you, if you raise saying, a, a cow entirely on grass, go ahead. Uh, you, you're talking about it in the context of corn. Now, I've never heard about it being made from corn before, but in Ireland, it's only made from grass. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like fermented grass in the U.S., um, they, use, uh, they use corn in their silage. Oh, okay. So and that, would that include the, um, like the fucking head itself or would that just be the stock? I think it includes everything. I think they just chop up everything. All right. We so. do something like that here, but we don't consider it silage. It's not fermented. They just. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, and plus, like, you know, um, I, I think I've seen some crazy statistics, like 99% of all corn grown in the U.S. is, is GMO corn. So um, you have that aspect to it, of it as well. Zero I'm not as knowledgeable here. about. Um, yeah, I know. You guys, like, I don't understand. It's the argument that I use. I, I, I tell people, you know, they're like, oh, you know, G they'll say to me, you know, GMOs aren't bad. I'm like, well, why the hell has the entire European Union banned them then? Like, use your head, you know. But well, in the U.S. The we have all they're, these they're lobbyists. All that... <laughs> but there's, there's the ones that are. What's know? that? They're not all bad, obviously. Oh, but there's right, going to yep. be the ones, yep. you know, you're going to have some kind of fuck, fuckery, as you say, um, when, <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all GMO uh, corn. You know, you can't get any better than the real stuff, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. Like, I um, honestly, you know, I found it easier to assume that um, that people are lying um, first and foremost until I'm proven otherwise. You know, it's like there is so much um, in the U.S. where, you know, there's so many lies um, from people that are, you know, in the business of, of producing food. There's so many lies. You just you, you would drown in a sea of lies um, that it's really difficult um, to kind of parse it out. I mean, that's one of the things that drives me to uh, grow my own food is, is that I don't trust um, anybody when they say, you know, this was, you know, sustainably raised or ethically um, harvested, or we use good business practices. Like, I, I mean, and, until you can prove to me that that's the case, I'm just going to assume you're full of shit. So it's and unfortunate, but it's from a consumer perspective. And though yeah. you're right, because, you know, even down to how they advertise the final product, we've all seen like the, the burgers and McDonald's compared to the picture, you know? You know, when when they say like yeah, oh my god, yeah, yeah, um, and then it goes goes different phases like, you know, what the farmer says they're doing versus what they are doing, like the, the weird definitions of grass fed and uh, organically raised, blah blah yeah. blah, yeah. It's weird when the definition is yeah like disingenuous, like you know it was made by some or it was paid off by someone, like it's, it's bad practice. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's um, it's unfortunate, but it, it's just the easier way is to assume that that you know corporations are are lying to you, right? Um, you know, there was um, like with McDonald's, there was a famous um, case a number of years ago. They use so many fillers. Like when you buy those um, those hamburger patties, I think it's like some crazy thing. It was like only like for a while, it was only like sixty to seventy percent of it was meat, and everything else was fillers. Um, and so that really kind of bothers me. Like, what the, what the hell are your fillers, you know? so Our, our burgers um, here from McDonald's, 100% Irish beef. That is it. Oh, God. That and good. Irish yeah. beef is a That's premium the across be. the world. So, you know, not bad. It's, it's grass-fed as well. That's what they say. You've got a bunch of grass. Yeah, I was just there about to go. say that, that's why it's so good with with uh, with Irish beef is because you guys got a whole bunch of grass that they can eat. Mm. You know, in the, in the U.S., they just um, uh, they they just feed them uh, you know virtually mostly corn. Um, 
so it, it's just it, it's a terrible uh, circumstance to find us in, but it, it's 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 the reality that we live in. So yeah, that's it's, the um, well, you in the lockdown, right? We're yeah. in our worst lockdown you possible. Lock- we're, we're, we're in a pretty bad lockdown at the moment. Level five, yeah. highest infection rate and dead rate. Pretty bad. Well, actually, oh my god, not not the worst dead That's... rate yet. Our first was the worst, but we're we're getting there. This is this is so in Ireland. You guys have a bunch of um, you guys have deaths too. We're having yeah. up to like six, death, 60, 60 to something yesterday. sixty to ninety every day. Like. Well, it's not sixty ninety every day. We we have it, a lot less than that for the last three days. It has been. Yeah. Let me take let me take a peek here. I know I know sixty two was like yesterday. Ninety three think... the day beforehand. That's fucked. Yeah. That's pretty bad. But actually, no, I leave it. But pe- people are dying, um, and it's unfortunate. I used to believe that um, yeah. we kind of figured it out, but I'm starting to doubt it. Now that, that that case that it dies on contact with sunlight, I believe it now more than ever because during the winter you barely leave the house. Yeah. Um, and with no work, no nothing, we're barely seeing the sun. So, you know. Oh yeah. Well, that, there's um... during, the, during the summer the cases were never like higher I than. Will. 50 throughout the whole summer and then yeah you know, into winter it's just skyrocketing yeah. awful yeah well there was a couple um there's a couple of things that i had um that i had dug up that i that really resonated with me um with regard to covid so you hit on a big one uh which is one of the greatest um i guess they call it a correlation is um people who die not people who are infected but people who die of covid in the u.s are it's a very high correlation whereby they have very low um, vitamin D3 levels, you know, so they, they're not getting sun. Um, And so it's like, well, if you hide out in your house all all day and you don't get any sun, you're going to be deficient in vitamin D because the sun acts as a a precursor or helps um, uh, otherwise produce the vitamin D vitamin D3. And so if I was um, like in my thought process, and like I said, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor by any means, but in my thought process, you want to be outside you, because you, you need sunlight to, to help your body produce vitamin D3. Um, it just seems like it's concerning with lockdowns because, you know, you've got the whole psychological aspect of being locked down inside your home and you, you can't leave. That's going to have a tremendous psychological impact on you. But if you're not getting... Um, uh, if you're not getting sunlight, you're gonna ha- you're gonna be deficient in vitamin D3. Um, and then the other issue that we have in the U.S. is that it's like a 90 percent uh, is it a 90 percent probability that if you die of COVID that you were obese or something like that, or you're obese and you had an underlying um, uh, condition. Um, so you know, there's there's a couple things that are really kind of flaring it up in the U S and we're having some really big difficulties, but I don't know. I'm not sold on the idea that, that lockdowns are, are the, are the best way to approach this. So, um, you know, who knows, uh, who knows how bad this is going to get, to be honest. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I love to see in, in, um, the Southern States in the United States, like, like Texas, um, you know, people can just wear their mask when they go, if they want to see a show, like they wear their mask, um, people get tested, blah, blah, blah. I think that's perfectly fine. But the idea that it's yeah. shut down and no exception, yeah. it's pretty rough. Yeah. Um, like even with our pubs here in Ireland, Thomas, yeah. you know, if people were wearing a, a mask unless they were drinking, I think they'd be pretty okay. Um, yeah. if, you, if, you, yeah. if you had a limit of, you know, how much you could drink, blah, 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 they'd be pretty okay. Like, but this like, lockdown... Our, our hairdressers are shut and barbers are shut, but like... <laughs> If they're, they're, the thing is, that like every yeah, single no. one of them where we're taking the necessary precautions. I wouldn't go into a barber without a mask. No barbers. <laughs> Ignore him. T- put on your fucking microphone. You stop embarrassing us. But, uh, <laughs> like, if they're, if they're taking the necessary precautions, then they should be allowed to run their damn business, really. And I agree. It's pretty simple as that kind of thing, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. This goes back to what I was saying earlier with all the businesses closing down, right? You know, it's like, adults here right i mean you you understand what the risk is and so if you're a small business owner and you understand that that it's going to increase your risk or whatever you know for god's sake plus you know who wants to you know go around and not get a haircut i mean it's it's going to have a demoralizing impact on you to you know have your hair all long and not be able to have a haircut so you know i i agree with you thomas yeah now 
it, it, this is weird yeah. thing that when you talk about this, you get grouped with these people who would be anti-maskers or they'd, you know, be kind of conspiracy theorists for, for some reason. If you, if you kind of question yeah. what's going on, uh, you can you can be put in that group. But I, I, I genuinely believe more people yeah. are thinking, OK, let's uh, let's reevaluate how we're doing it. Let's just do it the safest way possible, because uh, yeah. what we're doing isn't sustainable. Yeah. Um, I, I remember yeah. it was it June yeah, I, or October. More there was more deaths from suicide than there was from COVID in Ireland, and it was so fucking sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's you know, and, and you know, my view on it is is like, look, irrespective of what your view is on masks, it's not that um, burdensome to put a mask on when you're yeah, when you're out absolutely. and about, right? Yeah, so. Sure. You know, I'll put on a damn mask if I can go get a haircut, you know, or like I can put on, a, you know, if, if I'm allowed to go to a, a pub and, and, you know, if I had to walk in with a mask on, that's not really burdensome. Right. I mean, it's like, you know, if you can go about and have a normal life, but, you know, you got to wear a mask for a while, that doesn't really seem like it's, it's going to be it, it's not too onerous of an ask for the people to wear a mask. Yeah. Um, like, you know, so it's like. My concern, though, is, is that we're almost a year into this and whatever we're doing doesn't really seem to be um, moving us in the right direction. I mean, I'm in California and the numbers in California are insane. You guys are crazy. So whatever we've been doing, yeah, whatever we're doing, we're not doing, it's not working. So maybe we should try something else. And, you know, it's like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I think we fundamentally, we have to question um, some of the underlying assumptions of, of how we're approaching this. But, um, you know, come on, it, it doesn't seem to be that. Whether you think that masks are effective or you think that they're not effective, it doesn't really seem burdensome to put on a mask, you know, to go grocery shopping or to get a haircut. That just, yeah. in my view, it doesn't seem to be too onerous, right? Yeah, But absolutely. like out in the U.S., like, you know, you got people in Texas, like, you know, uh, walking into Walmart and refusing to wear masks. So it's like, you know, w- what point does that serve? Yeah, why? Those, those videos just look ridiculous, people. But what it's the true. thing yeah. is, Chris, and it affects your entire nation, is from our perspective outside of the United States, we see that shit. And then, so, and then people say that's all Americans. And you guys get grouped with the biggest idiots. It, it's, it's horrible. No, it's not even a joke, man. Like, I, I have friends who... Yeah, who seriously hate Americans because of like you know Trump rallies and you know anti-mask. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Oh God, man. You know, it's been a tough four year for you guys. And you guys have it rough, and this yeah, is like most of our guests are American, and they're just such genuine, nice people. Yeah, I, I love it. But then you get lumped in with the with the fools. Uh, like it happened here. You know, the yeah. Irish drunkards. There was there was a huge alcohol problem in Ireland, and then even to today. Drunken Irish, you know. Yeah, it, it, it's um, it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, I uh, I cannot believe how much respect the United States has lost. Um, you know, because of Trump supporters, and you know, you guys turn on your TVs and you see it's our see. Capitol building being stormed by a bunch of lunatics. Um, you know, you know pe- people who think Hillary Clinton is a lizard, who, lizard person are storming your capital. Like, come on. Actually, I saw something That's exactly very right, funny. Right. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah. It, well, in any population, you're going to have people that are, you're going to have a few that are mentally unstable. And I think what, what Trump did is he caused all of these people who were the shadows of society to come out. And, you know, you, you're right. We've got people who think, you know, Hillary Clinton is a, is a lizard person and, um, you know, it, it really, it causes us as a country to, to, I think that our loss of respect around the world is probably well-founded because I'm embarrassed, to be honest, um, by some of the things that I've seen happen in my own country. And, and um, it's unbelievable uh, to see how far we have fallen and how quickly we have fallen. So, Yeah, but just because but, uh, people yeah, believe it doesn't Irish mean it's true. Trump. You know, like people thinking like less of the United States doesn't mean like their view is, is valid like the united states is a, is a beautiful place you guys are constantly making these these amazing changes um and you yeah. know at the moment it looks like you're in the right direction uh, canada is a couple steps ahead 
yeah. you guys are following up pretty nicely. Um, <laughs> you, you love to see yeah, it. Yeah, no, we. Um, what's that? I said you love to see it. What'd you say? That's true. Yeah, that, that, that's true. I mean, like every country will have its own. Um, I mean, every country has things that it could do better and, and things that um, and things that it does well. And, and um, you know, in my lifetime, though, I, I think that, that, that the U.S. Has, has lost quite a bit of credibility. But I can promise you there's a lot of wonderful people here. Um, you know, that we're not all, you know, you see this, you see the guy wearing the horns and the. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I see that, that guy. Was, like a, like a painted uh, face. I mean, that's just, that's just, that is the minority in the U S I mean, most people are not like that. I, I really hope that that's, um, um, that at some point in the future, we can garner a lot more respect because that's simply the, the minority um, of the U S there's a lot of good people here. And, and, uh, you know, when I hear you guys talk, I'm like, Holy shit, man, you, you can't even, uh, you can't hunt on your own land. You can't use a bow and arrow. You can't, uh, yeah that you know i'm like wow that's a lot of restrictions that don't you know like a lot of a lack of freedom but um, it don't so make sense be grateful for some of the, the freedoms that we have yeah absolutely that? and that, that's why i love the idea of the united states just you know freedom tribes there and in a world of you know withering freedom uh it's a, it's a great place to be yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um so guys, I got just a couple minutes left and then I got to jump. Um, yes, that's perfect. Anything else you want to like uh, talk about real quick or you guys got any questions? I'm good. Uh, come on, Thomas, you've more than that. Uh, What's the second best plant? <laughs> 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 no, um, what do I have? Um, what's, what's going on with your, your plot at the moment? Uh, I know you're working on a very small area. Um, how's things looking for you at the moment? Yeah, I... Um, Things are going well. So like right now we are, um, I'm, uh, we're kind of right in between gardening seasons. And so um, right now is the time where I'm doing a lot of prep. And so um, on my Instagram page, I have a quick video whereby, you know, I put up a little fence around my front yard property and I put the chickens in there. And what happens is, you know, instead of me going out there and, and spending hours, um, you know, doing yard work, the chickens will do all the yard work for me. So they'll, They'll till up the ground, they'll manure, um, they'll break any pest cycles that are out there. Um, so right now I'm doing a lot of prepping um, in anticipation because in like about three or four weeks, we're going to be starting seeds and there'll be a whole new, um, whole new gardening season for this year. And so and do you I've do this some, by yourself? Uh, some pretty exciting things. For... Yeah, well, me and chickens. <laughs> <laughs> well, for yeah, it, 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 if you do, if, if you... If you have a good permaculture um, approach to uh, your property, it should not require a lot of manual labor because mm -hmm. again, labor is an input to your system. So we can probably talk about that on the, on the next conversation, but you know, if you have a properly designed property, it pretty much runs itself. You know, like I, um, I go on vacation, you know, for more than a week and like my animals are fine. Um, they're all self-contained. I don't have to have somebody come in and watch after my property because it's been, it's been designed in such a way that I can, um, that I can leave and go on hmm. vacation and come back. Not everything's falling apart. So well, that's great to hear. <laughs> Again, that's great to hear. But, um, yeah. you know, Chris, yeah. you're a busy guy. We love having you on. Yes. Um, if people want to check you out, where can they find yeah. you? Yep. Yeah. Just check out my Instagram page. It's, uh, upgrade downloading, um, come on over and, and ask any questions. Um, I try to respond to all questions and um, yeah, I uh, just do me a favor for everyone that views this, go on YouTube, go on the internet and search out permaculture and um, grow your own food. I like the message. Well, there you go. Um, Chris, it's been an honor as always. Yes. Um, to anyone who listened. Yeah, absolutely. Whoa, whoa. Go on. What's that? Well, no, what were you saying? I, I got nothing. All right. Thomas, were you saying something? I'm, I'm just saying to anyone who's listened uh, or watched, uh, you know, thank you for tuning in and hope everyone has a great day. Take candy. Top of the morning, lads and ladies. Support for the Awful Irish podcast is now brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's global waste grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels and you're no longer lead the look of the Irish with the ladies. 
Manscaped just launched in Ireland. We've gone years without using the right tools for the job. You can now be one of the first men in Ireland to experience their life-changing products. Your balls will thank you. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code IrishPod at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com and use code IrishPod. <laughs> 